it's, it's incredible because uh, you succeed in talking about brief psychotherapy histories uh, in, in, a, in a very short time, in uh, five yeah. minutes. Fantastic. Um, yeah. That's great. And if someone else, uh, if someone wants to um, expand, to explore all this history, can find in your book, uh, book Brief Psychotherapies, uh, a lot of details and uh, a lot yeah. of yeah, a lot of the details about. Uh, yeah. I, I know some things about it, but there's areas I don't know, and I may not always be completely accurate. So I hope other people will add their ideas, yeah. and this is important, and that was important. Let me talk about Ericsson. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I've never met Ericsson, unfortunately. I wish I yeah. had. Yeah. Uh, but for many of you, yeah, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, because there, there is a, a thing about Ericsson in particular that uh, is fascinating for me because, uh, you know, Ericsson was probably the most important influencer in the brief psychotherapy field. And, and there is this thing that Paul Watzlawick said that in his early therapies he used a lot of formal hypnosis, but then he used more and more conversional hypnosis. So I was wondering if in brief psychotherapies there is something similar. I mean that in the early brief psychotherapy, um, we we probably uh, felt uh, a lot of Ericksonian influence. And now I'm wondering if um, uh, we have a less Ericksonian influence still continuing to influence our work uh, with Ericksonian content. What do you think about that? It's a good question. Um, like I said, I never met Erickson, so I was influenced by people who did know him, yeah. and uh, and then it goes on and on. But I think for many of us, Erickson was like Zeus in Greek mythology. Yeah. Realms of hypnotherapy, strategic therapy, family therapy, brief therapy, all seemed to come out of his forehead or wherever, wherever they came out of. Uh, I think... Uh, in the Greek mythology, it comes from Zeus's forehead, and it also comes from Zeus's leg, his thigh. Yeah. Cre creation does. Yeah. And in my in my poetic mind, when I think about it coming from his thigh, that makes me think about Erickson being in a wheelchair, and his because and because he's in a wheelchair, he has to learn how to use language more skillfully and how to observe things carefully. Yeah. So I think his great contributions was his use of language. Uh, many books have been written about Erickson. Uh, Uncommon Therapy by Haley yeah. is the first most people should read. It's very, very yeah. good. Uh, we already mentioned the book on your shelf behind yeah. you, the Common Case Book by O'Hanlon, which has 343, I think, cases, a page for each case. What was the problem? What techniques were used? How did it go? What the uh, It's an interesting way to look into Erickson. Yeah. Uh, I think O'Hanlon's book, Taproots, is very, very good, 1987. Another one by Dan Short, Hope and Resiliency. Short and two of Erickson's daughters wrote it. Um, uh, Erickson was a giant in many contributions. I think his most important legacy today is the idea of utilization, to utilize or use whatever the client brings to help the client solve the client's own problems. Uh, he had ideas about strategic directives, his work on hypnosis and uh, without trance communication, suggestion. Uh, a lot of what he did now we have absorbed it, and so we don't even think of it as Ericksonian, but getting a goal, looking for the client's strengths, finding out exceptions to the problem, what can they do well, when have they done it before, how can they do it again, using metaphors and imagery, uh, storytelling. So uh, much like the Brief Therapy Center at MRI, a lot of what they did when they did it was radical and groundbreaking and new, but now we just think of it as, it's just brief therapy. Uh, that's when I say like Erickson was like Zeus, I mean that whole different ways of thinking. Before Erickson, most therapy was the treatment of psychopathology. 
the patient had some kind of like psychological infection yeah. and the doctor had to diagnose it, go in and get it and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Somehow drugs or, or, or behavior or something. But, and then Erickson said, no, let's look at what people are good at. Let's see them as functional and healthy and try to bring out the best, bring out the strength. The, an the answer is within title one of Steve Langton's books, The Answer is Within. Uh, so I think it was an enormous paradigm shift. It went from thinking of, from pathology to problem solving. Yeah. It went, they're sick to, they know things, but they have to use what they know better. Maybe they'll learn new things, but it was a learning model, a teaching model, instead of a medical disease oriented model. So I think it's, I think it's profound. Uh, and, it's, what he, and it's uh, interesting because Medical was a, a doctor, a, a physician. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, Erickson was a medical doctor. Yeah. He was an MD. But he was an MD at a time when there was not a lot of good medicine in psychiatry. Uh, you know, they gave insulin shocks and they gave lobotomies and they gave these very heavy drugs to just put people to sleep. And so he had to learn other ways of working with people. He had to use his wits. Uh, there's many stories about him being, uh, as a young boy, he's paralyzed and he watches his family and he sees how, if somebody says something, he discovers what they call in English a double take. You hear it and then you realize they said something else. Oh, so he yeah. practiced things so there'd be multi-leveled communication. Then he started to try triple the take, uh, mm -hmm. slipping in embedded metaphors and messages, uh, seeding, as, as uh, Jeff Zeid calls it. And so he became a, a genius at observing and using language. Uh, my, my friend, um, John Frickman, who passed away last year, and also mm -hmm. one of Erickson's daughters, Carol Erickson, uh, used to tell me a lot of stories about Erickson would emphasize observing things, noticing how people sat, how they crossed their legs, did they have a callus on their hand, where their eyes moved, also paying real attention to what people did uh, rather than just having a theory and then always just looking to prove your theory is right. I was very interested in what the person actually brought to the room. So, uh, so it seems that the legacy of Milton Erickson is still uh, valuable, it's still big, it's still um, giving us something valuable, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think um, uh, it's like somebody discovered gravity or magnetism. Yeah. Yeah. Now we've a lot of things since, but oh, electricity or magnetism or gravity, yeah. uh, they're they're in everything we do, even though we've we've thought of different ways to, to use them. Uh, but the, the origin, the beginning of it, I think a lot of it came came from from Erickson. Yeah. You know, some of it some of it also came, I think, from Freud. Uh, I know Freud is not very popular with a lot of people nowadays. But before Freud, people, when people were, did unusual things or strange things, they were either evil, they were crazy, it was the devil, mm -hmm. or they were stupid. Yeah. Uh, they were ignorant. And Freud said, no, they have an unconscious, they have motivations, yeah. emotion plays a role. He got people to think about things more psychologically instead of just in terms of some moral or some educational model to, to think psychologically. And I think he was a major shift getting people to think psychologically. And then Erickson was another major shift to get think, people to think uh, adaptively or constructively or what, what useful things might, they might have. John Wheatland was part of this too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. in fact, um this is a question I want to, to ask you, uh, because, um, you know, uh, everybody knows uh, very well uh, Paul Watzlawick or Jay Ali, uh, or other guys, or the famous guys from uh, MRI, Mental Health Institute, um, and they help us to improve uh, our skill and see the therapy in a totally different way. But, as you say, what about John Wickland? that was the master of one down position. Um, he wrote less book, but it was for he was for sure uh, a great contributor to the 
brief therapy development? My understanding is that John Weakland was hired by Gregory Bateson along with Haley to go study Erickson. Yeah. And they spent many weeks over many years visiting and learning from Erickson. The people who really, I met John Weakland a couple of times, but the people who really knew John hold him in the highest regard. But in general, I think Weakland is underappreciated because he was more thoughtful and he was understated. Uh, uh, he wasn't as dramatic as some of the other people. I remember John commenting and joking that his style did not get the big keynote speaker fees. Okay. He said, oh, if I could talk like that person, I would get $5,000. Yeah. Uh, laugh about it. John started out as a chemical engineer. Mm-hmm. And that switched, and he was in a PhD program, try, a combined sociology and anthropology program. So he was very interested in science as a, as a um, chemical engineer, and then in anthropology and sociology, very much observing what people did. Okay, so he got very interested in this, and then he went and worked with Bateson, and then he helped found the Brief Therapy Center at MRI. The two, uh, the two great books yeah. from MRI. Mm-hmm. Changed 1974 and the tactics have changed 1982. John Weakland is an author of both of them. Yeah, he's yeah. the best author of both books. John also was an author of the uh, the double the famous double bind yeah. paper with Jackson, Bateson, Haley, and Weakland. Yeah. He was he was also the one who went with uh, with Haley to spend all those years studying. Uh, studying uh, Ericsson, uh, so he, he did a lot. And he was also uh, the one that discovered uh, Steve Deschelter. He, he yes. was yeah, the master of Steve one of the masters of Steve yeah. Deschelter. Yeah. yeah, you can see my notes, I was about to say that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, John was very smart, he was low, low key, he was subtle. I think John's biggest contribution among many others, was his clear, his clear thinking and his emphasis on observation, on looking to see what's really going on rather than just having a theory and then looking to prove that your theory was right. Uh, I think it's significant that Weakland and the early MRI group, along with Carl Rogers, were the first to do audio and video recordings of psychotherapy sessions so they could review them over and over and see what really was going on. So that was a really cool. important thing. A um, couple other things. Uh, um, you know, so they had the, Wheatland was one of the, in the original MRI group who developed the idea mm-hmm. that the unsuccessful attempted solution actually perpetuates the problem. And so we have to help the client to do something different so it's not just more of the same. Okay. That was their okay. underlying idea. In 1992, 93, there was a conference held in New Orleans in honor of John Wheatland. Uh, and, uh, this book, Evolving Brief Therapies in Honor of John Weakland, was published in 1999. Uh, Steve DeShazer and Wendell Ray were the, were the, were the editors of the book. Uh, I th- um, John was a great mentor for Steve DeShazer. Yeah. And one of the things that really impressed me about John was when Steve Steve started being an MRI kind of therapist. He was interested in problem formation. Uh, prior, but then when Steve shifted and became more interested in solution development, um, John continued to be his best supporter. That he was so open-minded, that he was a great mentor, he, uh, he wasn't jealous, he, they were also good friends. I once interviewed uh, John Weakland with Steve and I asked John what he wanted his legacy to be, how he wanted to be remembered. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and John said, I'd like my message to be stay curious. Yeah. Stay interested, stay open-minded. So I've always appreciated John because he was open-minded, how uh, plain speaking he was. He cut through a lot of BS. He, he saw things as they really were. Uh, and that he was a, a great mentor for Steve and how open-minded he was. He was very keenly intelligent, but he was subtle. He was not exactly shy, but he would just sort of say things in a very dry, understated way. Uh, he, w- he wasn't flamboyant. <laughs> <laughs>